The sand builder automatically feels the needs to justify the choices he's making. Why isn't he doing what this other builder is doing? Be sure to download the note card you'll find in the video description, a link to the note card, and follow along with the lesson, fill it in. It'll be a record for you of what you have learned in this lesson from the Bible. And I'll, by all means, get your Bible. Go get your Bible. How many of you have a Bible? I always ask that question. I always like to see the Bible. So get your Bible, follow along, and if you like this sermon, ring the bell. Also, uh, give us a thumbs up, subscribe to the YouTube channel, ring the bell to get a notification of when new content is added. If you want to follow us on social media, links to our social media account are in the video description. So now, let's jump into the sermon. I have to make a confession. Sometimes preaching is discouraging. The fact is the stuff that I teach is hard. It takes commitment. It takes discipline. And most of the time, it's unnatural to the way humans are. It just isn't the way most of us are wired. So sometimes preaching feels like it's an uphill battle. All this stuff about building our lives on the rock can sometimes seem a little overwhelming. Who really wants to do this? Sometimes I wish this job was easier. So I thought today I would take a different approach. I wanted to give a an easy message. So I have my Bible open to Matthew chapter 7. If you have your Bible this, uh, for this lesson, and I hope you do, how many of you have your Bibles? Hold your Bibles up. Let's see your Bibles. Matthew chapter 7. When you get to Matthew chapter 7, turn, if you will, to verse 24. Matthew 7 verse 24. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on the house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell. The floods came, the winds blew, and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Many of the times we look at this passage and we focus on the difficult lessons of building on the rock. Today, I would rather take the path of least resistance and talk about what it is, what it takes to build our lives on the sand as we look at five steps to build your life on sand. Let's notice this, if you will. First of all, read God's Word. Now, I think it's interesting that Jesus does not say the guy who builds on the sand never hears his words. Rather, in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 26, he says, everyone who hears these words of mine, notice that. He talked about those who did hear his words. Of course, if you don't even hear the words of Jesus, your life is going to be built on sand. But an even better way to do this is to listen to Jesus, go to church, listen to sermons, participate in Bible class. Why not go all out and even have a Bible reading plan? The more you read per day, the better. It's so easy these days, you can even get it on audio, listen to the Bible in the car. There are Bible apps for your smartphones, your, your tablets, 
uh, your netbooks, your computers, everywhere you go, you can get a Bible plan. Here's what makes this step so important. If you go to church and read your Bible, you can more easily deceive yourself into believing you must be building on the rock. Not to mention you're laying the foundation for a ready-made gripe session against God when things don't go well for you. I mean, you've gone to church. You've listened to sermons sometimes even for an, an hour or more. You read the Bible. Shouldn't all that count for something? Shouldn't God protect you from storms for all that? I know it sounds counterintuitive, but if you want to build your life on the sand, start by reading God's Word. But then the next thing I, I want you to notice that we learn here, and that is not only read His Word, but this step is key. It is the signal difference between those who build on the rock and those who build on the sand. Matthew 7, 26 says that if you want to build on sand, all you have to do is take all that God, uh, uh, the word of God that you've heard and you read it and you ignore it. Don't do it. I mean, why would you want to do that? It's hard. It's work. Sometimes it's boring. It's re rarely entertaining, not to mention it's often hard to see how what God's Word says will actually get you what you want. I'm reminded of the little story of the, of the little boy that his parents put him on the bus to go to uh, church bus came by and picked him up in the morning, so the little boy went to church that morning, and he came home, and his mom asked him, said, Son, what did you learn in Bible class today? He said, Well, he said, I learned how all these jet planes came in, said they were loaded with bombs and napalm, and they come in over the Egyptians, and they sprayed that napalm, they dropped them bombs, and they just wiped them out in the Israelites were able to go into the promised land. She looks at him. She says, now, son, I know you didn't learn that in Bible class. Now, what did you learn in Bible class? He said, mom, he said, I believe you'd believe that story that I just told you rather than what that teacher told us in Bible class. Said, well, I wouldn't even believe that stuff that we're taught in Bible class. And that's the way a lot of people Look at the Bible. It's so incredible. It's so amazing, some of the stories. How could that be so? So there's no entertainment about that. So why not have the, the jets fly over, the F-18s and, and all, and the Harrier jets, and have them fly over and drop the bombs? That'd be more interesting than what we read about in the Bible. So let me give you some practical examples of how to make this work. God's word says to seek God, uh, God's kingdom and his righteousness first, Matthew 6, 33. But why do that? There's so many other things that seem more important. Obviously, what we need to do is make sure our financial house is established first. Make sure your secular education is set. Your college education is established. Your career future is made certain. Of course, that takes a lot of work. So then you need to make sure that all your recreation and entertainment is provided. And obviously, after all that, you need time to unwind. So, so who has time for God's Word? Just ignore it. God's Word says to forgive those who ask for forgiveness. Luke chapter 17, verse 3 and 4. But why do that? If you forgive them, you might have to be friends with them still. If you forgive them, you no longer have the uh, momentary pleasure of nursing your grudges. You're no longer able to feel spiritually superior by holding their sin against them. 
Obviously, holding their sin over their head allows you to have a sense of power over them. So let's just ignore that part of God's word. God's word says if someone sins against you, you should go talk to them about it alone. Matthew chapter 18 and verse 15 said if your brother sins against you, go tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But why do that? That's no fun at all. I mean, if you do that, you don't get to feel the joy of sharing a juicy tidbit of gossip with someone else. And there's no way for you to prove to others that you are better by showing how awful someone else is. Not to mention, if you go talk to them alone and they repent, you have to forgive them. And they'll get away with it. It feels so much better to punish them for what they did than talk to them. So let's just ignore that part of God's Word. And then number three in the five steps to build your life on the sand. Here it is. Justify how you're living. I know this isn't specifically mentioned in Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 through 27, but I know it had to happen. I mean, these two different builders see each other building these houses. And as the one does the hard work of building on the rock, the sand builder automatically feels the needs to justify the choices he's making. Why isn't he doing what this other builder is doing? There are all kinds of great justifications. Let me share a few with you. Nobody else is doing what that rock builder is doing. No one else is being meticulous about where he's laying that cornerstone like this builder is, this rock builder. Surely God doesn't really expect that from me. Or it's close enough for government work. You ever heard that one? If you were in the military, I'm sure you heard it. Or that's just not natural. You see, normal people, they don't behave like that. I think God just wants me to be happy. And I can see living like that in some situations, but some people say, well, my situation is different. Or that's just too hard. That's just too much work to make sure my cornerstone is set on a solid rock foundation. People will think I'm weird. If I act like that, people will take advantage of me. I like the Bible and all, but let's not be too extreme with it. You know, the justification doesn't even have to be all that good. Just as long as it salves your conscience for ignoring some part of God's word justify how you are living. And then if that's not enough, then when the storms come, just blame God when things go wrong. Again, I know this particular step is not blatantly stated in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 24, but who controls the weather? I mean, Jesus was able to stop the storms, wasn't he? And when God talked to Job, he admitted he controls the storehouses of snow and hail. He is the father of rain and the cl and cleft the channel of torrents of rain and the way of the thunderbolt. Notice Job 38, verse 22, he says, Have you entered the storehouses of snow, or have you seen the storehouses of the hail, which I, God speaking, have reserved for the time of trouble, for the day of battle and war? What is the way to the place where the light is distributed, or where the east wind is scattered upon the earth? Who has cleft a channel for the torrents of rain, and a way for the thunderbolt to bring rain on a land where no man is, on the deserts in which there is no man,
to satisfy the waste and desolate land and to make the ground sprout with grass. Has the rain a father or has begotten the drops of dew or who has begotten the drops of dew? From whose womb did ice come forth? Or who has given birth to the frost of heaven? The waters become hard like stone, and the face of the deep is frozen. You see, my building, we'd say, was doing just fine until these storms came. God keep these storms from happening. Consider the kind of storms that come to one's life. Getting fired. Done that a few times. Illness, done that a lot of times. Death of a loved one, everybody's had that happen. Or a spouse or even a child have that happen. That's very devastating. Betrayal by a friend or a family member, especially a spouse. Unemployment, relationship trouble. Or if you play the stock market, stock market crash. Acts of nature that destroy homes or property. And the list could go on. So this is important. Don't miss this step. If you decide that the problem is you didn't prepare for the storms, that's just, that just naturally happens in life. And by building on the rock, you might change the way you build. As long as you keep blaming God for allowing the storms, you'll be able to successfully build on the sand. So why worry about all that trouble building on the rock when you can just blame God when the storms come? But then building on the rock, watch this, will let you watch your life crumble. In Matthew chapter 7 and verse 24, the rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew, and beat against that house, and notice this, when the storm came, it fell, and great was the fall of it. The sand builder's house falls. The storms have eaten away at the sandy foundation, and for a time, both houses look stable. For a time, both seem livable. In fact, for a time, the sandy foundation seemed better. It was easier, more natural. It seemed to be working just as well, but as the repeated rains came, the water started to eat away, erode away at the sand. Of course, at first, that didn't even seem so bad. A little extra work, and you could get that sand back in place. In fact, you could even, heard the term sandbag the foundation, get a little extra protection, but then another storm and another. Then a major storm hit. The foundation washed away. The house fell. Here's the problem. When do you most need a good house? Right smack in the middle of a storm. Here's the thing. The sandy foundation doesn't cause your problems when life is sunny. It causes your problems right when you most need a house. The sandy foundation will fail right when you most need a foundation. And that causes a problem. If life is sunny, hearing about a sandy foundation doesn't faze us at all. It seems like it must apply to someone else, but I assure you, Eventually, this is the final step of building on sand, watching your life crumble. So there's the five steps. Read God's Word. Ignore God's Word. Justify how you live. Blame God when things go wrong. And then watch your life crumble to pieces. Doesn't that sound like a plan? Now, I have to tell you, I feel a lot better. That was a whole lot ser easier sermon to preach, lesson to teach, than it was to just 
tell people what they should do and do something that seems so unnatural to them. The path of least resistance is just so much easier to travel down and preach about. Of course, some of you are saying, you don't want to see your life crumble. Well, if that's the case, then all I can say is you might as well not only come to church and read your Bible, but actually do what he says, no matter how difficult in the moment or even how counterintuitive or unnatural it seems. And if your sandy foundation has washed out and your life is crumbling. Here's the great thing about our rock. It's not too late. You can start building on him and he will bring you through. Yes, it will be stormy. Yes, it might be painful. But in the end, you will be held up by his strength. And I know building on the rock is not always easy, but it's simple. Read his word and do what he says no matter what. Building on the rock starts with these steps. It starts with the question that the Philippian jailer asked in Acts chapter 16 and verse 30, and that was, what must I do to be saved? You see, in order to be saved, the gospel must be heard. Like in Acts chapter 8 and verse 15, the parable of the good soils. Are those who hearing the word, what do they do? They hold it fast in an honest and good heart, and they bear fruit with patience. We learn in Acts chapter 8 and verse 32, Jesus said, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. You hear the gospel to learn the truth. But then the gospel must be believed. Jesus said, I told you that you would die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. John says in John chapter 20 and verse 30, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. The Philippian jailer was told the first step in his salvation was to believe in the Lord Jesus, you and you, and you will be saved, you and your household. And then sins must be repented of. We learned that in Luke 13, 3 and 5, Jesus said, I tell you, no, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. We see the Philippian jailer practicing showing repentance by taking them the same hour of the night and washing their stripes and immediately being baptized. We'll come to here in a minute. Acts 17, 30, the time of this ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. That's a change of mind, a change of heart, and a change of the way we are living our life. And then Christ must be confessed. Matthew chapter 10, verse 32 Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, he says, him will I confess before my Father who is in heaven, but whoever denies me before men, him will I also deny before my Father who is in heaven. We find in Romans chapter 10 and verse 10, for with the heart man believes to righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Then there must be baptism by immersion. Acts 22, verse 16, Saul was told, Arise and be baptized, wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Colossians chapter 2, verse 12, we learn that it's a burial, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all trespasses. And we learned that baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you 
not as a removal of the dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 3, 21. And there must be Christian growth and faithfulness unto death. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 2, we learn that we must be like newborn babes and desire the sincere milk of the word that we may grow thereby. We learn in Acts chapter 11 and verse 23 that when Paul came and saw the grace of God, he was glad and he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. And then we learn in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3 that his divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own grace, glory, and excellence by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. And then he says, watch this verse 5, For this very reason, make your every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, virtue with knowledge, knowledge with self-control, self-control with steadfastness, steadfastness with godliness, godliness with brotherly kindness, and brotherly kindness with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election, for if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 18, we're to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to him be glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. And in Revelation 2.10, do not fear any of those things which you're about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested and you will have tribulation 10 days. Be faithful until death and I will give you the crown of life. Be steadfast, Paul says, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing this, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. We must obey the gospel to be saved by the Lord in heaven. 2 Thessalonians 1 and verse 8, since indeed God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, watch this, in flaming fire, afflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those, watch this, who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. What will happen? They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. We're to purify our souls by obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love. Love one another earnestly with a pure heart. Have you done this? We're saved by God's truth, not by our feelings. We're told in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 13 to enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Now, thanks for joining us here on YouTube. Be sure to download the note card that goes along with this lesson. We also have the archives on rumble.com. Our username there is SPH Church. Join us if you're in the area, Sunday morning for Bible study, 935, Sunday morning worship service, 1045, our pre-evening worship service is at 4 p.m., Wednesday evening Bible study, 630 p.m. Come join us in person 
or watch us online and be sure to download the note card that is a part of all these lessons in the description below.